And over the last several years, there's been tremendous interest in developing milestones in something called Entrustable Professional Activities, or EPAs, to help us bridge the gap between these conceptual general competencies and how we might look at them in behavioral terms to make sure that we're able to identify accurately and validly a trainee's progression through their program. So this is the Dreyfus model, and this is an adaptation from uh, David Leach uh, and Tom Nasca. And so you'll probably recognize um, a number of your trainees are at these various levels. A novice is simply somebody who doesn't know what they don't know, right? That's the person coming into medical school on day one. They really don't know what they don't know. They're excited, they're energized to become a medical student, but they have no idea uh, about what they're the journey they're about to begin. We've all been there. The advanced beginner is they're beginning to know what they don't know. So think about that graduating medical student. Yeah, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff. I want to go into surgery, but boy, there's a lot I don't know about surgery. That's the reason I'm doing a residency. But they're beginning to recognize what it is they've picked up and what it is they need to acquire over time. Competent is somebody who's able to perform the task and roles within their discipline, but they have restricted breadth and depth. These are the people that are just good enough in the Dreyfus model. They can function as an internist, as a surgeon, but they don't have a wide breadth and depth of skills. Proficient is somebody who's now consistent and efficient performance of these tasks and roles of their discipline. They know what they know and don't know. So these are where, these are the kind of people that really have a good sense of where they are developmentally. And this is actually, for most of us in residency, where we want to see our trainees in most of the competencies, particularly patient care and medical knowledge. You would hope that they're proficient by the end of training so that they're now on a trajectory that will enable them to acquire additional expertise once they enter unsupervised practice. Terminology is also important, and this also comes from the international uh, CBME collaborators. And I just want to share these with you because you'll hear these terms used. And so this is an opportunity for you to kind of get a, a sense of kind of what the field is using when it thinks about assessment. Competent is possessing the required abilities in all domains at a specified stage of medical education or practice. Now you notice this is a little bit different than the Dreyfus definition. In this definition, competent is stage dependent. And we think that's important because we want to know if people along each stage are where they need to be at a minimum. And that's what competent should look like. Discompetent is someone who's relatively lacking in one or more domains of acquired abilities at a specified stage of medical education or practice. So they may be good, for example, in medical knowledge and professionalism, but they're lacking maybe in those communication skills. So they're discompetent communication. And you would want to know that so that you can kind of intervene and remediate, make sure they catch up and fill that gap. And then finally, the folks we worry the most about are those who are incompetent. These lack the required abilities in all domains in a certain context, regardless of stage of medical education or practice. And again, it's important to identify these people as early as possible because the likelihood is they probably shouldn't be a physician. And we don't want to pass them through the system if they're truly incompetent. But again, remove them from the system, but also importantly, to help them identify a career path that's a much better fit for them. So with this kind of background and some language, let's move now to talk about milestones. Milestones, as you can see here again, are just a significant point in development. They help us to determine if somebody's on the right path or the right trajectory, okay? Another way to think about a milestone is in a scheduled event signifying the completion of a major deliverable or set of deliverables. In this case, we've tended to think of this in terms of process in the past, but we're really more interested in whether or not somebody's made that significant point in development. Now, milestones, if they work well, should enable the trainee, the program, and the regulatory bodies to know an individual's trajectory of competency acquisition. Here, like the Dreyfus model, the focus is developmental. We want to make sure they're on the right path. And this simple diagram just helps to illustrate that. So you can see that the resident in the A prime, the farthest to the left, is somebody actually is on an accelerated trajectory. And the milestones will be able to pick up that they've acquired skills earlier than expected. And so you might want to adjust their curriculum 
and their educational experiences to help them continue on an accelerated path. Conversely, the individual who's denoted by the dotted line mark C is somebody who's simply not going to make it. They've started behind and they've never caught up. And the milestones again would identify that this person is substantially behind the acceptable trajectory as shown in the A box in the middle there, that this individual really needs to be identified early and probably removed from the system. Now the person labeled B in the dash line is somebody that is off to a slower slope, but if given some additional time, something that's completely acceptable in a competency-based system, will make it. They will become fully competent. They're just going to need more time. And again, milestones potentially provide the mechanisms by which to identify which of the trajectories your trainees is on. Now, this comes directly from the Internal Medicine Milestones Project, and this is just an example of a milestone. And this is in the ACGB competency of patient care, and it's denoted up top. And then within each of these broad categories of competencies are sub-competencies. In this case, we're looking at clinical skills and reasoning. It's one of the sub-competencies. Now, what's important is that you'll notice in the middle column there, it gives some benchmarks around when people should reach this level of performance. This is considered competence and by when they should reach it. So that they haven't reached this particular level of skill in this particular sub of managing patient using clinical skills of interviewing and physical examination, you would be very concerned and you would want to make sure you intervened. And in this case, we could look at the 18 month box. And so for somebody in internal medicine, by 18 months, they should be able to obtain the relevant historical subtleties that inform and prioritize both the differential diagnosis and the diagnostic plans, including sensitive, complicated, and detailed information that may not be often volunteered by the patient. So this is a higher level of skill. This is working with more complex patients, being able to really tease out those important key features or subtle differences that can lead to a more accurate diagnosis. How would you know? You would look. So you might use a standardized patient, for example, an intern in their first six months, but by 18 months, you ought to be using a lot of direct observation. This is where faculty, by observing a trainee in their second year, can they actually do this, would know whether or not they've actually met this milestone by 18 months. So what are the benefits then? Well, they provide the learner with a clear path of progression. There are no surprises. In fact, when we put these milestones out for review by the educational community, including residents, the response from the residents was overwhelmingly positive. The reason they liked them so much is that for them, they felt like this is one of the first time they actually were given a blueprint or a roadmap about what was expected of them along the way during all three years of training. So again, for them, this creates a transparent blueprint and there are no surprises. The milestones also allow for rich formative feedback because they're behaviorally described, you can tell a trainee what it is they are doing well and where they need to improve. And so learners will know where they are and where they need to go. And again, because they define specific behaviors, you can focus your assessments and sample behaviors so you get a good sense of what the overall competence of the trainee actually is. What are some of the criticism? And they are legitimate. Milestones tend to be reductionistic in nature. Successfully checking off a list of milestones does not necessarily predict competent practice in a highly complex healthcare environment. So just a bunch of checks on a checkbox or a checklist doesn't necessarily equate to the whole or that in fact somebody is overall competent. And we don't know yet whether or not assessment of competence, what a learner can do under controlled situations, predicts performance well in actual practice. In other words, what do they do habitually when they're not observed? That work needs to be done. And as we point out, there are 141 internal medicine milestones and programs cannot assess them all. But they are a blueprint and roadmap to help design curriculum. And I think the challenge for programs is to pick those milestones that make the most sense to assess that are more representative of overall competence. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. 